Um, the agenda of uh, this talk is, yeah, we will be talking about why standardization and innovation are important to bring together. Then I will uh, provide you with main contents of the chapter. And I will try to give you an overview about what has been written there and the ideas uh, that were elaborated. And I would like then to propose a way to teach the content. So this is a proposal. You may do it differently, uh, absolutely. But this is my thinking about how the content could be um, conveyed to students. And I will provide at the end some general experience from teaching standardization. So what is the learning objectives of the chapter is, first of all, to to provide students the possibility to study the interdependencies between innovation and standardization and how standardization and innovation can benefit each other. Also to give some concrete examples, as I said today morning, it's very important to give the students these examples to have the, uh, a very good understanding of the concepts. But also another thing is to look at the interdependencies between research and standardization. And the chapter ends with the so-called innovation potential and standardization. And this is based on research that I have done with some colleagues. And uh, it shows how companies may actually benefit from standardization in order to boost and to promote innovation. So this is based on our own study, um, which has been uh, conducted yeah, during my work at Fraunhofer. Um, yeah, at the beginning, we should also confess that standardization and innovation may have opposite definitions if we look at them from this way, from this perspective. So standardization aims at keeping things the same if we are really speaking very, very uh, simply about standardization. On the other hand, innovation is about developing new things. So how can keeping things the same support the development of new things? And therefore we have here, uh, so to say a conflict, a tension between innovation and standardization, at least if we, we look at it from that perspective. And here there are very interesting citations. The one saying standardization and innovation give the impression of being opposites and standards are the flux between freedom and order. And yeah, I'm starting this, the, the chapter always by explaining what innovation is for students. So if they are not innovation management students, if they have been learning innovation, they know what innovation is. If they are engineering students and did not have an innovation management course, so they have to know what innovation is. First of all, we have to realize that invention, innovation is more than an invention and uh, innovation is actually invention plus exploitation. So coming up with something new, but also exploiting that invention in practice. So an innovation without a practical implementation does not make sense, right? And what's important, and this is, I think, essential, is that to say to students that Innovation is not this breakthrough innovations that we see from time to time. This is not the smartphone as innovation as, yeah, at, at the very beginning as the smartphone was invented or the, the Apple iPhone. No, innovation actually can be, can have different flavors. So, and one of the definitions, uh, which are very prominent. I think that they are really good. This is the OECD definition saying that innovation can be new to the firm, something that the firm absorbs, something that the firm takes from outside, which is new to the firm still can be understood as innovation. The innovation can be new to the market. It means that for the, in the industry in which the company is operating, the product or the process or whatever, it can be something that is new to that that area and new to the world. And this is the breakthrough innovations. And uh, we don't see many of them actually. And some people think, yeah, when they think about innovation directly about this, 
and they would like to see examples how um, standardization has led to this uh, innovations but these innovations they are not many actually right and the process of emergence of these technologies which are breakthrough is very complex of course there are other um, typologies of innovation like incremental radical or disruptive innovation which is used nowadays very frequently because of digitalization etc yeah so this is i think very important to provide to students so that they know that there are many classifications and that innovation can be um yeah can have different flavors so there are many reasons saying why innovation is hump or is hampered by standardization yeah we should confess this for instance yeah standards contain static solutions they are frozen or uh, standards induce a lock-in effect. It means that we are locked in a certain technology. And we experience that yeah, many times when we, uh, does somebody want to use another uh, word processor than the one that you are using now? Perhaps, perhaps not. Or would you, would you change your keyboard? Yeah, from, yeah, in, in France, the, the keyboards that are used are other key, right? When you are in uh, yeah, in Italy, you are using Quetti. When you are in Germany, you are using Quets, not Y but Z. So, yeah. And uh, as I moved from um, Germany to Italy, I tell you that I have written everything wrong because only of two buttons, two key that, that were really changed Z and Y. They take the place of each other, and it was really a nightmare. So only two keys were. Uh, so decisive uh, in, in, for my experience. Um, another thing, also the the, yeah, the lock-in effect induces the switching costs. So your switching costs from one technology to the other will be um, uh, very high, and therefore, yeah, you would like to stay with the technology that you have, and therefore, you don't want to change. And another thing, this is called the penguin effect. Um, it is called the penguin because when a penguin comes into the water, all the penguins also follow. So for the standards, it's also the same. You, yeah, in order to opt for, to adopt the standards, you would like that others also use it. Uh, otherwise it would be quite problematic for you. On the other hand, we have um, some innovation promoting features of standards. Um, standards ensure compatibility, um, support the achievement of a critical mass, which is very important, at least at the beginning of a uh, the emergence of a technology. And standards allow technology transfer and facilitate research. So this is a very nice thing with standards. We have a document in which we are documenting about innovations, perhaps sometimes about requirements, sometimes about solutions. And this is nice. So this document can be diffused. So we are making perhaps the implicit explicit. And this is a big discussion, actually, how to externalize knowledge, right? And standards offer this kind of yeah, properties. Um, okay. Now, I would like to come back to, to the uh, keyboard example. And um, yeah, the QWERTY example, I think, is a good example to show uh, how innovation can hamper and innovation can uh, foster innovation. So um, it is hampering uh, because we don't want to switch to another keyboard and it is fostering because we are not thinking about, yeah, when we are using the same keyboard, it is installed in every computer. You can use every computer, every, yeah, and it is, it, it supports innovation in this, uh, in this way. Yeah, um, it was actually a, uh, it, this is a change with respect to the first edition of the book because uh, we got the feedback that perhaps this is not the only story that is uh, made prominent. So the story that is made prominent is actually there is a better keyboard called Dvorak and that enables people to be really much more, much faster in typing. But because people are locked in, they did not switch to Dvorak. And the reason is that, okay, people did not coordinate, cannot coordinate their actions together. And therefore, 
the, the, the quality, which is the lower standard, could be, so to say, the successful one, and Vora could not be the one that is used at a large scale. Yeah, this is, by the way, very interesting. How can a lower or lower quality standard, so to say, um, prevent a better one to get into the market? Right? Yeah, by the way, you know where, how the QWERTY has been uh, invented? It was when we had these typing machines, it was done in a way that the, the possibility or the probability of the two two uh, key, keys are go or are in jam or jam together, the probability is very low so that people can go very fast. And it was the spirit of the QWERTY. Okay, um, the second story says, this is actually not true that the QWERTY was higher quality and therefore, yeah, we stayed with the QWERTY. It is perhaps, or that, sorry, that the Dvorak was higher quality. The Dvorak, if it was actually higher quality, there would have been an entrepreneur coming in and making it accessible to many people. So this is, I just, we, we, we make that also very, very clear in the book that there are two versions of the story. When people are locked in, they stay with a lower quality standard, but we say we should take it really with care, with care. We should be very, uh, we should pay attention to this, that there are other versions of the story. Good. Um, then what I found useful is analogies while, while teaching. Um, analogies can be make or can make some concepts which are a bit abstract, really much more understandable. And here we can think of standardization as pruning trees. So what, why are we doing this? Why are we pruning trees actually? We are pruning trees in order to make them better receive light and air. So if we have a canopy, which is very dense, we prune them and then in this way, air and uh, light could, uh, could go better in the tree and the tree will flourish. And this is actually also the spirit of, of standardization. Think about the fact that if there are no standards and every company is doing its own, is developing own, its own technology, actually, there will be a lot of redundant efforts, perhaps. Um, and therefore, standardization, from this perspective, it could really make a lot of sense and um, be very helpful for the development of technologies and for the accumulation of innovations. Yeah, he, here is, is also a, an, an aspect which is yeah, very related to this. So standards can play a role along the uh, technology life cycle from the beginning until the end. And we have in the technology life cycle, of course, the emergence of the technology. This is something that Perhaps engineering students, if they do not know it, it should be, of course, explained emergence. Then we have a growth phase, then there will be a maturity phase, and perhaps a phase uh, when we have dec a declining um, improvement in performance. And standardization can play a role along all of these phases. So it can be, we can have anticipatory standards, what we see very often in ICT. So there are four would looking answers to expected interoperability problems. We have enabling standards, so to say during the maturity uh, or the growth and maturity phase of the technology. And we have responsive stand standards, which are developed, so to say uh, at the end uh, or in the maturity and decline phases of a technology. And of course there will be afterwards a new technology coming in and then there would be the same phases going again and standardization plays a role. Then another thing, and yeah, the discussion also between, of, yeah, perhaps it is interesting for students who'd like to, to do research and uh, in the future and for PhD students, um, to which extent can um, standardization support research or R&D can support um, standardization? So. For sure, when companies are doing R&D, they are taking their innovations to standardization. This is something they can, they can do and um, 
they um, yeah they support their um, results in this way but also standardization can feed back to uh, r d in the sense that we use the results from the standards in order to um yeah to um, to enrich the knowledge during the r d phase yeah i'm yeah, many of my students, and I'll come back to the, the topic of patents, um, they tell me, yeah, why should we go to standardization when we can patent the results? And it is a, um, a very important question, of course. Um, and of, yeah, there have been a lot of studies in, in, in this, and what I'm telling my students, and I'm answering this way, you know, there are about 85% or let's say 80% of patents that are not used, which means there is a lot of knowledge that is not used because this is the right to exclude somebody from using something. But have you ever seen a standard that has not been used? At least, at least it is used by the members in the committee, but the standard is diffused and the standard will be used by, by many, as many individuals and as many companies as possible. So we are making a standard to use it. We are making a patent just to exclude others. And this is a very, I think, an interesting thing um, to show the importance of, uh, of standards and standardization. So um, another, another thing is, um, yeah, which, which is very interesting. Um, why do not people or researchers participate in uh, standardization committees? Yeah, this is also a very interesting question. Um, and I think there are many reasons for that. The first thing is that sometimes people think that research is why it is somehow uh, very uh, far from, from practice and because practice yeah, or standardization should be very close to practice and therefore, yeah, re researchers have not to do anything inside the standardization committees. This is their opinion. I'm not sharing that with them, but this is yeah, one of the, the, yeah, the explanations that uh, can, be, can be provided. Another, another thing is that, um, yeah, we know that researchers, they're getting their promotions inside the universities based on publications. So if you are good in standardization, yeah, this is good for you. But yeah, nobody will be rewarding this. And I think this is a, this is a problem. And the, the other thing is when you're, yeah, the, this in the standard, you don't have a series of authors, right? So we, are, we, we want, of course, as researchers to have publications. And therefore, I think this is, I, I'm not here trying to provide a solution. I'm trying here to, yeah, to raise some issues that could be that could be discussed. Um, yeah, he, yeah. This uh, this slide, uh, this picture shows that the process of innovation it has many steps, starting with fundamental pure research, then going to perhaps oriented basic research, then we have the applied research, so to say to look for applications for the uh, basic research, then we have the experimental development and diffusion at the end. And it happens that there are different types of standards that can support these, uh, these transitions or these, these phases like semantic standards, uh, measurement and testing standards, interface standards, etc. So when we are talking about research and standardization, um, in the book we provide an example, which is the MP3 example. The MP3 has been, um, yeah, developed by Fraunhofer. So it is uh, one, yeah, a big uh, applied research institute in, uh, in Germany. And MP3 was the result of research done at the University of Nuremberg and then went to, to Fraunhofer. And then, yeah, based on that research, there have been a lot of applications, of course, the iPods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, yeah, it is actually a successful example for how research uh, and innovation and standardization because MP3 has been also brought to standardization. Good. Um, now, how can standardization really support innovation? Um, and yeah, this is, 
this part of the uh, of the ch chapter is based on a research that I did with a colleague, and it has been published also. And here I will summarize, and it is um, summarized in the book, and everything is provided in order to have a good understanding of um, all the aspects I will be presenting. Now, as you can see, um, we distinguish between standards as supportive for innovation and standardization as a process, right? These are two different things. So the standard is the output of the standardization process. And we are talking about also two things when we are thinking of innovation. The first is, yeah, the invention, how standardization perhaps or standards can support invention. And the other is about exploitation. So bringing things into practice. Um, so one of the things that, or the, the aspects how standardization can support uh, innovation is, for instance, this is what we have uh, noticed. Some companies, they take the standards in order to need to know what is written there, or not only the standard, many standards, and try to exceed the requirements of the standard in a way that they are differentiating themselves from others. And I remember, yeah, one of the uh, people we have talked to, the expert, he was really a, an expert in, in the area of innovation R&D in his company. And as we started to explain to him what is the objective of the interview, he told us, you know, um, I will deceive you, but standards do not support innovation at all. And we do not have any example of this in our company. I told him, I understand, but let's yeah, have the interview um, and try to, yeah, to develop our, our ideas, etc. He was kind and then he accepted, of course. You know, and then after about 10 minutes, he gave me an example about how standards are actually supporting his innovations in the company, his R&D, without knowing that. Of course, I did not tell him, yeah, this is a good example. I, I made the interview very normally so that he doesn't feel offended. But I think that many people do not know this and we have to bring it at the surface, right? At the surface that these kind of things happen without that companies really aware of them. Then, yeah, this is also another, another feature, how or an aspect, how innovation can be supported by standards. It is that company So this is perhaps just summarized by this uh, citation saying the set of standards in our enterprise is the basic prerequisite for us in order not to develop products for the trash. Trash can, right? So otherwise everything what they are doing, everything new will not be sold on the market and then at the end the innovation will not be successful. Another thing, yeah, which we find we found also very interesting is that innovation can be stimulated through the update of standards. I know that companies may hate that. Standard version one, standard version two, but this update, they can provide ideas, impulses for companies to rethink about how they are doing things and then improving things or innovating their products. Then another thing, which is more on the exploitation side, and uh, it was also very interesting. And this example is actually very known. There has been a lot of consultancies uh, that have been built around standards in order to advise other companies how to use standards, right? And we call it here business model innovation. So it, these are business models that are created with standards, with the use of standards. So many companies, they don't know how to do certain things. So ISO, yeah, everyone needs ISO, for instance, like the quality standards, they need some support. Yeah? And this is, um, yeah, some way in order to, um, yeah, how standards can support innovation. Um, then a very interesting example is, uh, now we are not talking about the standard in itself, we are talking about the standardization process. And many informants, key informants said that when we go to the standardization committees and do the work, we get very nice impulses through our discussions with the, the people in the committee. And then we get 
very good insights that we give to our R&D departments to use it, of course, during the developments of certain products. So some companies can achieve actually a competitive advantage, although it is not the uh, purpose of standards, right? But companies can achieve a competitive advantage depending on how well and how quickly they can fulfill the requirements of a new standard, right? If they do not participate, they will be very slow in accommodating and using certain standards. And of course, innovation communication is something that's um, very interesting. Um, here it is a citation from a, a company saying, we inform our customers about our activities and the standard setting process uh, because customers themselves are also very interested in knowing that the products that they are buying, they are also corresponding to certain standards. And it is also a way of making some marketing and saying, okay, uh, yeah, we are following really uh, the, new, the very new updates uh, of the standard, etc." So it is about building trust with, um, with customers. And it is, um, yeah, also, um, let, let's say, sometimes it is a, a marketing instrument, right? We are using the standards for, uh, for our, uh, in our products. Then, yeah, another um, interesting feature is the absorption of innovation. So I told you before that the absorption of innovation is in itself an innovation. So companies cannot absorb innovations very well. So if we take the example of enterprise resource planning, ERPs, we can see a lot of failures. I have heard about companies that needed 10 and 12 years in order to implement it. So absorbing and installing certain types of innovation is not easy at all. And it happens that um, yeah, standardization can help a lot in absorbing um, innovations. So not only the development of standards was important, but also we were able to identify new application areas for our products. And this is a very interesting example of a company that started in the 70s with 25 people. And the CEO and the owner of the company himself, he says, we could have, or we have scaled up our company from 25 to 800 people because of standardization or thanks to standardization. How is it? It is that he was in the uh, standardization uh, committees and he got a lot of impulses for new applications of his new, new technology. Right? And this new technology, these new applications have created new markets. So this is also another aspect um, about what we call innovation potential and standardization. Now, I would like to make a proposal how to teach standardization and innovation. So this chapter, I find it really useful uh, to start the lecture with a kind of workshop, a workshop with students, perhaps 60 to 90 minutes, depending on the number of students in class. And the workshop consists in dividing students in groups. And some of the groups have to think about what are the hampering features of standardization, the innovation hampering features, and what are the innovation fostering features. So other groups do that. And then this will lead to a class discussion afterwards. And I think that if students do not know much about innovation or innovation management, this is also okay. You can just say that innovation is something new, give some examples of products that are innovative and students can start yeah, brainstorming and working in a group. And based on this, a class discussion of course is initiated. And um, then, after the workshop, the instructor can go through uh, through the uh, different contents of the uh, of the chapter. Um, yeah, this and yeah, very important also during the lecture then uh, is to refer to what has been said during the workshop during the, the debate because this will improve the learnings um, the learning of the students or the learning performance. To cover the material, yeah. By the way, two different. Uh, ways can be suggested. So the traditional teaching, so just frontal teaching and with the workshop, but what we are experimenting also uh, a lot um, in our, in my university at Politecnico di Milano is the flipped classroom. This could be very interesting also. Students may read this chapter before coming to class and then the class will be about a discussion with students about the main concepts and the main uh, contents of the chapter. 
And it really works well, given that students, of course, uh, prepare the contents before. Otherwise, it will be just a, a frontal, very traditional classroom. <clears throat> now, I would, this is my last, uh, my last slide for this, um, for this talk. So I would like to, to tell you a bit about my general experiences with teaching standardization. So I have been teaching in the University of Leipzig um, business management students, and they have been taking a course of innovation management, and I integrated some of the contents in the innovation management class. So they were master students. And then I have been teaching it also at Politecnico di Milano. I have integrated the, um, uh, the content, some of the contents into an advanced lab uh, with engineering students. I had 120 students and uh, yeah, we, we, they, they received um, a lot of information about standardization. Um, and this should be actually my, my last point in the slide, but what I'm also doing with my engineering students is that we have done the IEEE um, standardization game. It is the Mars colony game. And it was very interesting. The game is played in four hours. The game has not been actually played before uh, in a virtual way, but I have done it during the COVID time with my students and it worked really very well. And the idea is that students really negotiate with each other. Um, so you have a lot of roles, yeah, roles, and then students have to negotiate uh, in order to, uh, yeah, for, for a certain standard. Um, it is about, yeah, um, yeah, the, 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 or perhaps here another important point is uh, that I have students from many uh, countries in the world. And it was really interesting to see how these negotiations uh, are taking place in an international context, because you have different cultures coming together. And I think, I think if, yeah, it could be really um, also, beside the game, it could be also a research topic in itself. Good. Um, what I try to do when I'm uh, teaching standardization at the very beginning is that I try to relate it to the daily life of students. Um, not only the examples of um, the time and McDonald's, what I have uh, cited today, but in the morning, but another example, which is very interesting is the train track. Yeah, we know that the train track uh, should be the same from country to country, at least in Europe. Otherwise we will have problems uh, in having trains uh, going uh, through different countries. So this is a, also a very interesting example showing how important standardization is. And it's really from the day-to-day -day life of students. Um, also, because now it's not more the same. Um, before we had to struggle with the plugs of the chargers uh, of uh, uh, mobile phones. Yeah, uh, if you have a mobile phone from another, so now it, it's more or less not, not anymore like that, but it was for a certain period of time, a very problematic, if you have a, a certain brand, you should stay with it. Otherwise, uh, you cannot uh, you cannot charge uh, your uh, mobile phone. Or if you forget it for a conference, you cannot get the charger of a colleague. Um, then, yeah, um, what's what's really good actually, and this is uh, I would like to to end my talk with it is that engineers and management students exhibit really a high level of interest for standardization once they know more about the topic. So there is somehow a, um, a certain uh, threshold that we have to, 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 um, to go beyond. And then when we, uh, we achieve that, then students are really very interested. Good. So I'm done with the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for your interest and looking forward to your questions.